Good morning. Well, I, I will tell you that uh, it's an amazing thing to watch young people um, sharing Christ and discipling young people. And uh, that's uh, one of my favorite things, to watch what's happening in our young adults, our high school, middle school groups, and the numbers of people that are volunteering and discipling these kids and the way it's changing their lives, and it gives you hope. We, uh, we're bringing to a conclusion this series called Stand Firm. And I, and I have to tell you that uh, we often, in advance, prepare our sermon series. And, and it's interesting how often the sermon series that we prepare actually ends up uh, fitting things that we didn't even know were going to happen. And uh, it's another one of those times where the message of standing firm no matter what happens, uh, really resonates with what we're experiencing here. It's been a hard couple of weeks, and um, uh, things happened that you never thought would ever happen. And what do you do with that? How do you handle it? And so diving into this series has been helpful for those of us who were, are leading the campuses and even the church in the Silver Valley. You know, we put together a podcast called The Overtime Podcast, and last week we, we specifically addressed the, the pastor's death in, in um, the Silver Valley. So those of you who haven't seen it, I think it'll be helpful for you. We go into things in, in a deeper way in the Overtime Podcast if we weren't able to get to it in the messages. And so, again, the, the uh, Overtime Podcast is weekly, and, and even tomorrow we'll be going through some things that we know people have already been asking based on today's message. So I hope you take advantage of that resource. The book of uh, First and Second Thessalonians was written by Paul, who had uh, at one time persecuted the church, but then saw the resurrected Jesus and became a disciple of Jesus and then began planting churches all over. And his life was not easy. He went from being respected and financially stable and... and uh, uh, you know, high in this society to being chased and pursued and beaten and whipped and stoned and shipwrecked and jailed and finally beheaded. He would bounce from town to town. He would go and start uh, witnessing to folks and build a church, and then he would stay there a while, and then he would move on and write letters back. That's how we have many of the letters that we're reading, including First and Second Thessalonians. When Paul got there, he had been run out of Philippi, when he uh, began to preach, their people accepted the word that Paul gave. They believed, became Christians. He stayed, and then he went on, and he wrote these letters back. And um, these people in Thessalonica had been persecuted and beaten and, and lost their family members sometimes and were struggling. And, and Paul's message to them was keep being faith-filled, keep sharing your faith. Keep being faithful. Keep loving in a way that serves, and, and keep enduring uh, because of your hope. And in the last few weeks, we've been walking through some of what he said, but now uh, the Thessalonians in Macedonia are struggling because they're starting to lose loved ones. They're starting to lose people they cared about. Uh, they, they really expected, I mean, Paul had said, you know, you're going to be here a while, there's some things that are going to happen, the Lord's going to return, but it's going on longer than they thought. And if they could only imagine us still being here 2,000 years later, they're, they're wondering, what these people who gave their lives to Jesus, some of them are dying, being persecuted, some of them are just dying of old age or other health issues, and, and so what do we do with that? And so Paul writes them, at the end of this first uh, letter to the Thessalonians, some important information that are, it, are, that's very helpful for us today. I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. By the way, uh, I'm not going to go into this as the depth I, I have in the past, uh, this uh, issue of um, what happens when you die and the second coming we've actually attached some of the series we've done on that to the app or the website, so you can listen to that in its entirety. But uh, they did this, that, this subject does relate to those, and so let me just read this. 
1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. He uses this terminology several times. He says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. All right, let's, let's stop here for a minute. There's some important things we want to point out. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant about what happens when people die who are believers. And uh, he says, you grieve because you're going to miss them, but you don't grieve like those who have no hope. Now, that's an, that's an interesting phraseology, those who have no hope. Who are those? Those are people that have never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and therefore, they have no hope of the kinds of things that God is promising to those who are Christ followers. I know maybe you've heard, we all go to heaven, we all live and die, and, and this gracious God we serve looks past everybody's sins, whether they ask for forgiveness or not. And uh, so we all have this similar hope. All dogs go to heaven, and all human beings do. That's not what Scripture says. That's not what Paul says. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what the Old Testament says. Again, we've got people who, who uh, claim that they are Christians because they believe Jesus rose from the dead, but they don't understand that what Jesus says about that uh, is very important and that we're, del uh, as believers, we've accepted the message of Jesus as Lord and Savior, the cross and the resurrection reveal who he is so that we could know that what he has said is absolutely true. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven. Jesus makes it very clear that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus, uh, Jesus' disciples in Acts 4, 12 says, there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved, not can be saved, by which you must be saved, except by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see here this, uh, he says, I don't want you to be like the unbelievers who have people die, who have no hope. You have hope. You can have hope. Now, as you go through this, um, I want you to understand that he, he then uses the illustration, the, the true story of Jesus dying on the cross, being raised to walk, uh, to live again, and uh, the resurrection of the dead. And he says, hey, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. And in the same way Jesus was resurrected from the dead, so too will we be. So not only did the resurrection prove Jesus really was who he said, but the kind of death that he had is being offered to us, meaning uh, not the crucifixion. He did that once and for all, although there are people who still to this day die of crucifixion. He's not talking about that. He's saying that the power of God revealed in the resurrection is a power that's being given to us. God's going to raise us from the dead in the same way. We're going to be changed. We're going to be uh, 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 with him. And, and so there's this hope that because of what happened with Jesus, that applies to us too. We're going to be resurrected. That's the promise. And he proved he can do it in Christ. He can do it in us. And we have the promise that he's going to. Now, he makes this uh, very clear that when the Lord returns, there will be some who have already died uh, in the Lord physically, and there will be those who will be left alive who are believers when he returns. And so the question is, this is taking a long time, what about those people that we love that have died? He says, 
uh, very clearly that the Lord's going to bring with him those loved ones. That uh, uh, Some people misunderstand this and and they think that, that uh, the scripture says that you're sleeping in the ground with your bodies until Jesus returns. And when he returns that day, then they are going to be raised up. Uh, and so they'll get there first. And then all the others on planet earth will meet them. And, and you no, know, that's not really how it's going to go because the scriptures are very clear elsewhere. Paul says to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. And he goes on to say, it would be better by far for me to go and be with the Lord. But he says, it will be, it's, it, since I'm still here, it means fruitful labor for me. So over and over again, it's very clear that the dead in Christ are with the Lord. And when uh, there, there's going to be this day when Jesus returns, those who are alive are going to meet with the Lord in the air with those we love. That's the promise. Now, I want you to kind of follow along with me here. He's, he's saying, I want you to encourage one another. Now, at the same time, there's some, some little, you know, sort of rabbit holes we can go down and we can chase. And let me just say a couple things. Um, the Bible says that God is not slow in returning as some uh, think of slowness but he waits to return because he wishes none to be lost. He's left us down here on planet earth to reveal to people, not only do we have hope about what happens next, but he wants us to share that message that Jesus wants to save. He waits because he knows there are still some who are gonna hear that message from us. And, and, and they're going to receive Christ. And so I want you to think about it this way. If you have a loved one down here who does not yet know Jesus Christ, then you're, you're the most important thing you could be doing is living in such a way that you prioritize the kingdom of heaven, God's overall eternal agenda. You know what's going to happen in advance. And if a person has not received Christ, they don't have hope. God waits to return so that we can spread the good news of the gospel with our loved ones, with people at work. He, he wants to save people, but he uses us as his uh, ministers of reconciliation. Uh, Paul said, we've been reconciled to God through Christ and we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We beg you on behalf of God, be reconciled. That's the purpose. That's, that's why Paul is even being able to write these people in Thessalonica. He's already gone and shared Christ with them. Now they're struggling with questions. They don't know how to answer. And now he's, he's, he's furthering uh, the, un, their understanding. He's encouraging them. He's reminding them of what he said with the, to them before because what, right now when you're in the middle of it, you may have been told something before, but you struggle because your eyes, you're in pain, you're struggling, and you, it's easy to forget, which is why we're told to encourage one another, to remind one another. This world isn't our home. It's not all there is. There's something else going on. God wants to save you. Now, as you walk through this, you start to, to uh, get the picture of what's going on. And so he encourages them. And then he goes on to say, hey, uh, be alert and be ready because the, the, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He uses the illustration of, uh, that Jesus used. If, uh, if, if somebody knew what time a thief was going to, to come to the house, they'd be ready for him. You know, they'd be ready to... Uh, to um, defend, protect. Uh, I, I think of that movie, that old movie, Home Alone, you know, like a kid who's got booby traps and all kinds of different stuff waiting. Come on, I know you're coming, right? In the same way, he says uh, he's going to come like a thief in the night. There will be people who say, peace and safety, everything's going well, everything's great, for us because we're winning. We got what we wanted. We won the election or we got the leadership role or we got our nice little house and everything's going the way it's supposed to be going. But uh, look out. The master will come when, you're least, when you least expect it. Now, 
He writes the, the letter of First Thessalonians, and then as always, I don't know if this ever happened to you, did you ever write a text to somebody you think it's perfectly clear, but then when they respond back to you, they start asking you questions that weren't in your text, you just assumed a bunch, and, and then, they're, then you're like, oh, wow, I, I missed some stuff, or they didn't get it, so I'm writing back. You ever do that? Well, that's what's going on when Paul writes Second Thessalonians. He's, he's written it, he's heard from them, and so now he's got another concern, and some of which is on the same subject that, uh, they, that he's already been discussing. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the second letter in response to what he heard after the first letter. So now let's look at this for a minute. And uh, he's, he's going to deal with the, 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 what we call the rapture being caught up with the Lord in the air. Uh, people will say, there, there's no word rapture in there. Well, not in, in English. I mean, it, the word is literally to mean caught up. You're caught up. The rapture is being caught up with the Lord in the air. Paul just talked about that in 1 Thessalonians. And uh, they're, they're trying to figure out how it all works. And, and again, I want you to understand that... that uh, uh, when you look at the different prophecies, they each deal with a different aspect. And when you put the prophecies together, you're trying to figure out which one came first, which came second, how do they all fit in, right? I have people right now asking me about Ezekiel 38 and about, uh, uh, you know, Israel being surrounded and is, are we there? And, and how does that fit? There's these passages, all the events are, are true and real, but you don't necessarily know what order they're in. Does that make sense to you? It's the same way Paul has given some prophecy about how the end is going to come, and Jesus has told him very clearly, but now there's some other questions. So let's look at this. This is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, in a sense, he's, he's using this caught up in the air. We're being gathered to him. I remember when Jesus was coming down in Jerusalem, and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have liked to have gathered you like a hen does with its chicks, but you would not have it. Now your house is, is desolate, left desolate to you. That was on the way coming into Jerusalem on the day he was betrayed, on the week he was betrayed. So now you see here, I would, uh, he says, I want you to know about uh, being gathered to him. Uh, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So he's got some people who are pretending to be him. There's actually a historical term for this kind of behavior. It's called pseudopigrapha. It means that you claim to be somebody else, you wrote a letter, you even sign it. You know, um, uh, we don't have anybody trying to do that to us in today's culture, right? Through the internet and all that. They were doing that back then, which is why uh, the books you have in your New Testament were carefully chosen based on they actually came from the disciples. They were already, people were trying to infiltrate the church by claiming to be somebody. And if it didn't come actually from them and they didn't see it hand delivered and it wasn't brought or it wasn't brought by one of the, the leaders affirmed by the apostles, it wasn't accepted. And so Paul's saying, listen, these people are sneaking in amongst you and they're unsettling you. They're shaking you up. Here's what they were saying. You missed it. Now, again, he's writing to Thessalonica. So you, you're in this little town, you don't have the internet, you don't have uh, uh, newspapers uh, and TV and all those kinds of things going on. So these people in Thessalonica, somebody's been there and unsettled them and said, you know what, the rapture is like this secret rapture, right? And you, you are the only ones who, you, you didn't make it. The Christians somewhere else in, in Corinth or wherever, they, they, got, they got taken, you missed it. So Paul's like, no, you didn't miss it because if, if I'm not there, you know, then it didn't happen. Right? I'm writing you a letter saying, no, 
Okay, let me give you some more details about how all of this gets laid out. And again, even uh, there's more that could be said, and there's more details written in the other New Testament writers. And again, I think God is purposely vague about putting it together for us. Uh, why do you say? Well, I mean, if he gave us the direct order, how many people would go, I'll wait until step 23 out of the 24, and then I'll do what God wants me to do? <laughs> Come on. Where are we at? We're on step 21. Step 21 lasts two years, two months. Step 20, okay, 22, we, okay, so wait, where are we at? I'm going to do what I want. Uh, step 23, right there, I'm in. Here's what he says. Don't let, verse three, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for the day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself upon, uh, up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until, it, until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed when the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and, and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will uh, believe the lie. So I want you to notice here, just briefly, they don't believe the truth, so then God sends them a powerful delusion based on the fact that their hearts were hardened. They didn't listen, so now, since you've already chosen sin, you won't believe, now you're going to be deceived. He goes on. And so... Uh, he says, for this reason, he will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. But we ought to always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Now, I want you to get a picture of, of what he's saying here. He's already talked about the being caught up in the air. And now he's talking about the timing of all of this and how it plays in. And uh, he, he says something. He says that uh, there is the lawlessness, the spirit of lawlessness that is already present. Uh, John said that the spirit, there's, there, there are many antichrists in the world, but there is the antichrist. He said, there are already many antichrists, but there will come one day the antichrist. He says uh, here, using a, 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 John's a little bit different than Paul and how he talks about it. Paul says, there is the spirit of lawlessness or the spirit of rebellion against God, against the laws of God, against the, the, the uh, designer. He says, there's the spirit, but someday there will come the lawless one, the man of lawlessness. And so as you lay all of this out, he says this, this uh, lawless one will even set himself up as a God on planet earth, kind of like a false Messiah. And there will be signs, miraculous signs, and, and people will be deceived because the enemy is also able to do miraculous things or at least make people believe that he, that he can. Now, I want you to get a picture of this. Um, he's, he's making it very clear that there will be an increase in wickedness. 
that wickedness and lawlessness will grow. Let me just uh, give you a couple of other passages. Uh, this is in Matthew 24, Jesus speaking about all of this. And he, he's talking about the, that people will go out and preach the word and, and uh, they'll believe. And, and then notice what it says in chapter 24, verse nine, Jesus said, they will deliver you up to tribulation and to put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So he's talking about the apostles who, by the way, they were, they were killed for their faith. They had tribulation. There is a difference between tribulation, which we will all encounter, and the great tribulation. Just like there is the spirit of lawlessness, then there is the lawless one. And the Bible, uh, Jesus is making it clear. He goes on to say, and then when this, this, uh, it gets darker and darker, he says, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. In other words, uh, the, the word love will, will have less power to it. It'll just be a word. It'll be, I love you, man. Love you. Love you. I, 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 I do promise to give your, uh, to love and serve and support from this day forward until Jesus returns or death take you home. Yeah. Until I decide I'm just not in love with you. I don't have that, that uh, lustful or desire or, you know, I don't have that feeling anymore. The Bible in another place says that the, that the people's God will be their stomach. And that, what that means in, in, in that, in that uh, language is their gut, their feelings. Their feelings will be in charge. That will be their God. So the, their number one question is, what would make me happy? What makes me feel better? And the world says, follow your heart. Do you see how those two things go hand in hand? You be you. You chase after your own dreams first. You're number one. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do, right? You're, you're your own God. And the God of heaven, if there is one, he's just this grace-filled God. Jesus doesn't say that. He's just a grace-filled God. He's a righteous, holy God who gives grace to those who receive him. He goes on. Because of the lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will go cold, go, grow cold. But the one who endures or stands firm to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be pro proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So Jesus is laying out this big picture sort of understanding. For Second Timothy, Paul says it this way. But, but you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. Here's one. They will act religious, but will reject the power that could make them godly. No, notice what does that mean? They're religious, but they reject the Holy Spirit and the word of God, the power that changes them from being uh, selfish, sin nature dominated. They will, they, they, he says that they're always able to learn, he goes on to say, but they never acknowledge the truth. They create a, a form of Christianity where they say they believe Jesus rose from the dead, but then sex it doesn't have the boundaries that God decided on because you know that's old time. That's, that's the way it was in the old days. We've grown. We're smarter now. We, we, you know, you know, there's this form of godliness that doesn't actually lead to any sort of obedience to Christ. He says, don't even have anything to do with people like that. Now, it's clear here that that Paul is writing in the first book of Thessalonians to believers who are being persecuted. And it's getting rough. For some of them, they're dying. In Corinth, they're not dying for their faith there. 
their prosperity has led them to be uh, snooty and, and, you know, kind of like a, a weak. But in, in uh, Thessalonica, they're, they've been being persecuted. People are dying and they're like, is, how much worse can it get? And so Paul's saying, hey, hang in there. You are going to be caught up to the, with the Lord in the end. But, but there's things that have to happen. It's going to get rough. Not just for you in Thessalonica, for the whole world. So right now, Corinth, if you're a Christian, is easier. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And some of the places weren't dealing with the same kind of persecution. Um, There's going to come a time where you're not just hated in Thessalonica or Philippi. You're hated all around the world. The Bible is clear that Christians are going to be persecuted. And every nation is going to come against you in one form or another. Well, uh, that is unless you, you allow Christianity to be shaped so that everybody's saved and you don't really need to do anything to be obedient to God. It's, 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 it, you know, unless you dumb down your Christianity, you'll be persecuted. And so it's interesting. It's almost like a bad word. Has anybody ever asked you if you were devout? Are you a devout Christian? When you hear that word, does that make you go, hmm, that's, I don't know, that's kind of a negative sounding, like a fundamentalist whack job sort of a, of a term. Devout just comes from the word devoted. Are you a devoted Christ follower? Are you, do you believe? Have you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And so you've been declared righteous and now the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your life to make you sanctified and holy and obedient to the Lord. Are you growing in that? Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. All the law and the prophets hang on two commands, love God, love others. Every obedient thing you do is to protect you, protect others. Yesterday I was putting up a fence. My little grandson had a hoe. He's five, six years old. He's got a little sister, four years old, and he's not, he's swinging that thing around. He went right over the top of her head. We were like, whoa, hold on. He starts crying. We're so mean. (laughs) My little granddaughter has no clue what's happening because she was looking down as it went over her head. We are like, you don't play with tools that way. And and I, I know that look in his eyes. I've had it many times. You hurt my feelings. You're not nice and you're ruining my fun. And then it's so funny because my little granddaughter's like, why are you being mean to my brother? (laughs) Humans. I want you to get a picture of this. Here's what's happening. Uh, let Let me just tell you, there are a lot of different versions of eschatology. There are some that are absolutely unbiblical. It's unbiblical to say that the, that, uh, the rapture's already occurred. Uh, you might hear it called preterism. It's unbiblical. Paul's fighting against it right here. But there are many ways in which uh, you can believe in the, the second coming of the Lord and the rapture and judgment that are slightly different than others, but still have the major principles. And so... Um, In our church, we want to be very biblical, but we recognize there might be differing views. But let me just give you my view of how all this plays out in in sort of a timeline. I believe that uh, it's very clear that lawlessness was going to increase, and not just in pockets. Uh, There were places where lawlessness was out of control in the first century, but there were other places in the world where, where it was very orderly and they, they were doing things right. There's going to be an overall sense of lawlessness. As people get further from the Lord and from the light, it gets darker. And where it gets darker, people run into each other in the dark. They run over each other. They, uh, they hurt themselves. They hurt others. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And, and Paul's saying here, I want you to... I want you to wake up and be alert. And uh, I, I just think about what's going on on college campuses right now. 
It's not the first time. It happened in the 60s. It happened in the 70s. It, you know, it, it, I get it. It, it. There's been pockets of it. It happened a few years ago. But uh, remember, God's looking at a big picture. So this is a fairly short period of time where this is happening historically, although some of you in the 60s, you know, you weren't even born yet. But in a, in a period of time, it's, a, it, it's, it's the spirit of lawlessness, rejection of authority is happening quickly. I think about the Ham- Hamas situation, something else. It's so interesting to me that this little seemingly insignificant country called Israel is being attacked. It's like the center of the world as far as its attention is considered is concerned. Would you agree with that? It's like everybody's talking about whichever side you're on. Everybody, it's always been Israel, especially in 1947. It comes back. It was like a miracle. It came out of nowhere, back to the, the, the land, which is, by the, by the way, prophesied about. And though most in Israel are not Christians, not even devout Jews, God always had a plan there. And it's so interesting to me with throughout history, this country that should be insignificant is always being attacked. Why does the devil always come up with ways to attack? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because it's through the Jews we have the word of God and it's through the Jews that the Messiah would come. If if you're gonna hate the God of the Bible and you're gonna hate this Jesus then, then destroying the Jews, and especially when the Bible makes it clear in Romans 8 and 9 that the Jews will come back into play uh, when, when Jesus steps in, it, the enemy has been attacking anybody who is a vessel of God throughout history. There's this spirit of lawlessness in our culture, this spirit of attack and division. And so it, it, here's the deal. I don't know when this rapture is going to happen. But here's, here's putting these two passages together, here's my view. I, my view is that it's going to get really rough and we're going to deal with tribulation and, and, and we're going to be hated and, and that's already happening. But uh, uh, the Bible says that at the, uh, the, the, the one who holds back the lawless one will be taken out of the way. And I believe when, what that means is the Lord is going to rapture the church out of the world. And when that happens, that triggers this great delusion that all that are left, that, 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 they, they're the ones who rejected Jesus to begin with because they haven't believed I believe that at that point now, the the one who holds back the enemy, the church, the light, the salt of the world, it's out of the way and here comes the enemy and he's going to come full swing and you and I, he's telling us what will happen. I don't believe we're, we're gonna be there when that part happens. The full on tribulation, the tribulation, not you're dealing with tribulation where death and disease and stuff happens. That's, that's the normal way of mankind because of sin and God protects us from the full swing of the devil. But then when God steps back and, and pulls back the, the archangel and, in, 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 and we're out of the picture, now I believe it's gonna get really, really bad. Now, As, that, as you walk through this, as you walk through this, then Jesus will come when the enemy has done his part, the, the full, the, the lawless one, the antichrist, the, the, the false prophet. I believe that, that Jesus then will come and wipe him out completely. And there will be, this world will be taken apart piece by piece and and the same God who created the first one will create this, the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21. And, and now God's people will be uh, with him once again and no more sin or dying and no more devil. And, and the world will be as it was supposed to be. And, and the reason he is allowing it to continue this way is because he wants us in part to hear the good news. The good news that this world is broken As it is, he allowed it to continue so that we would get saved. It's so interesting how people want to get saved when they deal with the consequences of their actions, the world out of control, 
Now they want something better. When things get good, we want to build our houses. We want to live. We want to sit on the beach. We want to do. We want to be all about us. We don't want to be worried about uh, uh, our lost loved ones in eternity because we're having it as good as you can get it right now. And I believe it is part of God's plan to allow the tribulation to get rougher so that people wake up and then then to pull us out and to end the full scale war is on. God is revealed for who He is. Those who die will be given a new body and be with the Lord until he returns to gather up those who are alive. Then there will be this period. I mean, I think the Bible's pretty clear about all those things. And and so that's where I stand on it. Again, part of my reason for liking being taken out, raptured before the tribulation is, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. I don't like pain. So I'm all for the pre-tribulation view. If he doesn't come pre-tribulation, then, then I'm hoping for mid-tribulation. If that doesn't happen, then I guess I'm stuck with the post-tribulation. And, but here's what I know. No matter which tribulation or when the Lord raptures us out, we, we are very clear. We must be very clear on what we are to do. We are to stand firm. Second Thessalonians, let me just read some quick scripture to you quickly. Second Thessalonians 2.14, he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. I want you to jump over to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, chapter 5, verse 4. He, he kind of ends this book in this way. Listen to this. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since you belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. He's talking about the judgment. But to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So we're called to stand firm. To, to, to encourage one another. He used that several times, to encourage one another with these words and to build each other up. See, that's why we do a life groups. That's why we text each other and call each other. That's why what matters most to me and to our team is not whether you have a high paying job or the house you want. It's not whether your kid gets a scholarship It's not whether you got a slice of the American pie. It's not even whether or not uh, Donald Trump or uh, uh, what's his name is the president. (laughs) I mean, listen, I have my preference for sure. But what matters most is that we're standing firm. And what does that look like? We're standing firm in our faith that works. That's how he started in 1 Thessalonians 1.3. He's, he's praising them for, for a faith that works. In other words, o- obeys Jesus and serves. He says, a love that labors. What does that mean? It means that I keep dying to self, you keep dying to self, and we love each other well in the kingdom of heaven. And we have a hope that endures We stand firm to the end and we help each other. We build each other up. We encourage one another to finish the race. That's my prayer. In a world where it's easy to get discouraged and people do. To have people around you that remind you and you to see yourself as a person who's a reminder of others helps us get through. And people will make mistakes, will lose heart. 
And that hurts too. And then we're tempted to throw up our hands and go, what's the point? Until we come in here again. Until we see our brothers and sisters and our chins are lifted up. And remember who he is and what he's done and what he's promised to do. And we remind ourselves again, that's not a fantasy, it's not a Disney story. It's truth. Jesus really did raise from the dead. He really is the creator, the one who holds it together, and the one who makes promises he keeps. Today, as we take communion, this is what we're reminded of as an anchor to our souls. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for our opportunity to come and see the world isn't as it should be, but it will be as it should be. And you're the key to that. Help us to stand firm. In Jesus' name, amen.